hentai is a significant part of the anime industry that nobody talks about. And I want to talk about it. I want to do it in a an intelligent and work safe manner while still talking about, you know, animated porn. But so let's start by kind of defining our terms. Um, hentai, as I, th I think most of us know, is basically animated pornography. Um, it has been somewhat overstated in its impact. Um, the vast majority of animation made in Japan is the anime we all watch every day. You know, a, a small fraction is actually hentai. Um, and the reason for that is it all has to be drawn. You know, you still have to animate all of it. Um, you know, classic or let's say live action material is very cheap to produce. It's one of the reasons why there's so much of it. Um, but hentai actually requires trained animators to actually draw all this stuff. So it's, you know, it's not this massive thing. But there's, there's a lot of it. A lot of it has been produced. And there's a, uh, let's just say, healthy market for it. So let's talk about this. Um, and you're right, Matt. Um, there's... Well, we'll see. We'll see about how long we can we can we can do this. Um, I, one of the things I want to talk about here is why so much anime is so extreme. Um, or, I'm sorry. Why so much hentai is so extreme? Anime is extreme too, but hentai particularly. Uh, we all know about the tentacle um, tentacle rape hentai. But what most most or what many folks don't realize is like, that's what most people thought anime was, um, because it was so prevalent. So much of the, you know, weird, violent stuff came out in the 90s, and in the early days of a major anime fandom in America, that that became a big, a, a signifier of anime. Um, and we could talk about, you know, uh, how right or wrong that was, but the point is, there was so much of that that it was able to become a signifier of anime. Why would there be so much weird stuff out there? Um, and there's two halves of that, right? There's demand and supply. Um, because, yes, you can say, well, it kind of exists, but then why does it exist? Why are people, why were people so interested in this material? Um, and I want to talk about a couple of different aspects of that. One is the fact that arguably people talk about, um, um, and yes, Liquidus, that's a, that's a good point. We'll get to that in a, in a minute. Uh, arguably the first hentai was this OVA series called Cream Lemon. Uh, basically back in the 80s, folks realized that they could release anime direct to video and that did not have to conform to any television broadcast standards or movie broadcast standards or whatever. So you could show anything you wanted to. People could just buy it uh, and send it straight to their homes. And so Cream Lemon was this, an attempt to do pornographic, you know, anime. And they also realized that that means you can do anything. Um, you can show um, blood and gore, and you can chop off a character's arm if you want to. Uh, characters can be any age you want them to be. You can, you can draw them any age. So this... This is what happened in Cream Lemon, and there are quite a few episodes of it. Um, indeed, there are several segments in Cream Lemon involving characters who are clearly underage. Um, and this is one of the things that popularized, for better or worse, Lolicon. Um, and that's a whole other thing that I don't really want to delve into in, in any detail here. Um, but it's interesting to me that the first hentai, if you will. There's plenty of hentai manga before that. But the, the first, you know, anime was a study in extremes. Was basically saying, let's push this as far as we can because we can. And I think that's left an indelible um, impression on hentai moving forward that if you're going to make it, why not go crazy because you can do anything. 
Um, and that led to all the tentacle stuff and all, all that material. Um, now, and we'll, we'll circle back to that in a second, but Liquidus brings up a thing I want to uh, bring up. So hentai in, um, uh, in Japanese means uh, pervert or perversion. Um, indeed, if you see the letter H, it is often a reference to hentai, um, sort of an abbreviation, uh, if you will. And it's one of those words that's kind of evolved over time. You know, you can't just say, okay, this led to this, led to this, and that's the entire meaning. Um, but it's interesting that this term for sort of perviness became a term, you know, um, for this, a lot of very extreme content out there. Um, and I think a lot of that can just come down to culture, to, you know, you need a name for something, um, and that name, that word is kind of, you know, moving around. Um, it's kind of, you know, available out there and folks start latching on to that. Uh, and it should also be pointed out, one of the things about hentai is that it is a subgenre of a, of a subgenre, if you will, or a, a submedium of a submedium, where not a lot of folks in Japan actually watch anime. You know, it's, it's a pretty small market. Um, in terms of, you know, the kind of anime we tend to watch over here. Um, you know, lots of kids watch Doraemon um, or, Co or Detective Conan. Um, but, you know, the average adult is not watching Naruto, right? So, hentai is a really small part of that. Um, so, I think that, that um, works into it. I think one of the other important things is understanding that Japan is a culture that has managed to integrate a lot of visual symbolism, visual symbology into its modern, you know, life where images of where, you know, if you see a sign of people, you know, saying people, men at work, for example, there will be an image of a character doing that. And it's not a simple thing. Um, um, it is like a, a, an anime character, you know, doing a, you know, uh, using a, excuse me, pickaxe or whatever. So there's a lot of, of drawn art in normal anime, in normal Japanese culture, pardon me, where, you know, walking around just Tokyo, you will see these visual images. And those aren't considered manga or anime, it's just illustration. Right, um, and they, they seem like super deformed characters to us, but it's just you know, illustration. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why hentai was able to sort of establish a foothold is because you could go into the back room of a video store and you know look along and see cover art. And if you saw cover art featuring a you know an anime babe, um, it wasn't as much of a leap. As it was for, as it would be for us watching and seeing animated characters. Um, um, there's just not quite that distinction between between these things. There's just more of that stuff around, if you will, in in normal life than there is over in the West. So I think you know you combine that with the fact that. Um, Sorry, checking the, the, the chat room here. Um, and yeah, there, there are a lot of abbreviations, a lot of, of letters um, in, in various things. Um, uh, in, in general, uh, in, in anime and in Japanese culture in general, you know, a lot of things get, get abbreviated just because of a lot of things having to do with language and it's, it's complicated. Um, but let's, let's get back to this thing that um, hentai tends to be pretty extreme. And the point here is that that brings along with it certain problems. I mean, when anytime anything pushes to the extremes, um, it becomes extreme. It becomes a parody of itself. It becomes um, ridiculous. It becomes silly. Uh, and it becomes impossible to take seriously. So animes always struggle with this thing. And I think that, that also ties into anime in general and the fact that anime is fantasy, right? Um, and I don't mean fantasy in terms of elves and dwarves. I mean fantasy in terms of anime doesn't exist. Anime is not real. And there's a real understanding amongst anime creators that they're creating something that isn't real, right? Um, 
it can absolutely evoke emotion, um, but these characters don't exist. So I think that allows hentai to be more extreme. It allows hentai to be more strange because everyone understands that it is it is not real. That these are not actual characters. It's one of the reasons why I think a lot of the violent stuff exists because that person doesn't exist. That person is not being violated because there is no person there. Um, for what it's worth, that is, and I, I, I am not an expert on Japanese law, um, but I have researched enough to know that um, there is a strong tradition in Japanese law that drawn characters, fictional characters, um, are not real and do not have, you know, uh, should not be considered as, um, as proof of perversion or proof of weirdness. You know, if you read something or you watch something that has this kind of stuff, you are not condoning that thing on those kinds of people because you're not actually watching people. You're watching fictional things. Um, so again, I think that's kind of an out for hentai to have a lot of extreme stuff. Um, starting with Cream Lemon and moving on. Now, earlier before we started doing this, somebody brought up Legend of the Overfiend, Urutsuka Doji. It's a legendary hentai series. Um, the basic plot is that there is this upcoming, this impending um, apocalypse. And that various angelic and demonic forces are working to either make that happen or prevent it from happening. Because it is apocalyptic. And it focuses on this, this main character who um, may or may not be this, this overfiend, this sort of apocalyptic character that will bring about this, this terrible uh, um, place that is basically, you know, um, all rape all the time in the prime material plane, in, in the normal world. Um, and it's this story where there's, there's a lot of tentacles and there's a lot of women having sex without really wanting to, um, and often dying thereafter. It's really dark. Um, it is one of the darkest things I've ever seen. And yes, I've seen it because people said, like, there's a plot here. Like, this is actually has a, it actually tells a story. What's remarkable about Legend of the Overfiend is that it does have a plot. Um, and not only does it have a plot, like, it has a real ending. Like, it builds up to something, and then it's like, yeah, this is where we're going, and this is, this is our point. Um, Legend of the Overfiend is about, like, how bad this is. That, like, you know... Yeah, it's porn, and yeah, it's, it's all kind of there for quick um, satisfaction, if you will, quick release, but that, like, there's a dark side to a lot of this stuff, you know, um, that, you know, sexual violence is really bad, and, like, it's not something that we should be, you know, looking forward to. Um, so it's weird, um, and you will occasionally find this. And that's another thing I want to talk about, is how, like, why is there so much story in hentai? Um, and, again, contrast this to your average live-action porn shoot. Um, yes, there will be some, um, you know, framing concept, maybe. Often not. Often it's just, you know... Two characters walk on frame, uh, or, you know, there they are, and there they go. Hentai reverses that. There's almost always way less sexual content than actual characters standing around talking and having plot. And that I find interesting. Um, partly because I, I'm interested in story, and I'm interested in those things. I, I find... Um, and for me, just to be, you know, just to throw that out there, um, I am generally more turned on by a story if there is some story, right? Just showing, let's just say, tab A going to slot B over and over doesn't really excite me. Um, but if there's characters, if there's something going on, um, that gets me going. 
um, usually. So point being, why is that? I think part of it is because, well, part of it, let's be honest, is because let's just, well, mm. it's hard, not a lot of folks know how to draw tab A going into slot B, right? It's a small market. So one of the problems you have anytime you're making one of those things is how do you, you know, you can't spend your entire time doing that because there are only so many people who can actually do it and that's going to consume your budget. So you've got to, you know, restrict that, um, which means more plot. But also the fact that there's more plot means that there's actually plot. There's actually characters. There's something to it. There's something more than just tab A going to slot B, which I think is, is important. Um... And what I want to know is, again, I think I think that's just, to me, yes, that is a factor, but still, it's odd to me that the market hasn't pushed for more straight-up sex in hentai. That there isn't just a lot of, of shows where just, that's all they're doing the entire time. You know, you might as well. Um, so I still don't understand that. And I'd love to know from the chat room why they think that might be, why there is so much conversation, why there's so much plot in these shows. Again, I think it's an it's an interesting thing. I'm not complaining, but I think it's it's unusual. Um, but yeah, and it, I should also point out one of the complexities about all this is that there's a difference between what's popular in America and what's popular in Japan. So you know, there's there's shows that have really made it big over here back in the day. Um, uh, oh, God, La Blue Girl was one of the big ones that folks would always point folks to. Bible Black has become kind of a, um, you know, a, a trolling watchword for, oh, you got to check this out because it's so ridiculous. Um, so I think a lot of folks, like you say, Liquidus, a lot of folks know Bible Black just through reference, uh, not because it's a particularly, you know, good, uh, good work. Or I don't think because a lot of, I don't think a lot of folks like really watch Bible Black as porn. I think they watch it for ironic reasons. Um, so yeah, it's I think that's that's remarkable. There's there's so much weird stuff out there, um, and you're sure you're certainly right, Hem, that there's a lot of Yuri out there. Um, I think partly because Yuri allows you to show you know more naked women than you would otherwise. And hey, you know why not? It, it's it's the it's, it's a classic thing from sort of uh, um, uh, you know classic porn. Um, but I think also Yuri allows you to create more complex stories because there's an expectation that stories focusing on girls will have more relational drama going on. Um, and. Um, yeah, you're right, Liquidus. It's it's also strange when you come across stuff like Spaceship by Agaruder, which is made by a lot of the staff of Tenchi, or some of the staff of Tenchi. And there's that stuff there. Um, you know, I, I think that's very weird. Uh, there is a certain very well-known, very popular, modern English-American voice actor um, who, I will tell you right up, did a hentai some years ago. Uh, and it is one of these, you know, fantasy world, um, sword and sorcery, you know, um, all girls are submissive slaves, hentai. And the main male character is someone you would recognize. Uh, it's really weird. <laughs> um, it's, it's kind of odd. Because you just, you know... A lot of actors, like, they, they need work early on, and they'll accept it, and they'll do it, and, you know, this actor's name is nowhere on the credits, it's all, it's all that, um, but that is, that is the way of it, you know? So, um, yeah, that's also kind of the interesting thing, uh, Daniel's pointing out in the chat room, yeah, there's lots of just bad anime. Right? There's lots of stuff that you'll watch, you're like, I can't believe I'm watching, I, I just can't watch any more of this. And there's a lot of hentai that's actually easier to watch than that. There's actually a story, 
there's actually you know there, there's actual stuff to to be interested in um Um, good question, Desert Fox, that, um, fair amount of directors, animators that have worked on both anime and hentai. Um, so, this is another thing that gets a little bit miscommunicated, where a lot of people think that, you know, there's no shame in doing hentai if you're in the anime world. Um, and the reality is, hentai is, you know, doing work in hentai is something that you're not gonna mention, you know, in passing, uh, it's not just like, oh yeah, I just I do that, no, no problem. It's, it's a normal thing. Um, on the other hand, it's the kind of thing where where if somebody says it, you might say, well, you know, times were tough back then, um, but you, you wouldn't hide it. In other words, uh, to the extreme extent that people would hide it if they worked in Hollywood, uh, where you just don't want to be known for that at all. Um, so I, th I think in in the anime industry, again, they're they're gonna they're gonna keep it on the down low, absolutely. But it's more understood that yeah, you might work on that. And again, this also gets into that complicated thing where if you're asked to draw the main character of a hentai series standing out on the street and walking into a grocery store, you know that's fun. you know nothing untoward is happening in the scene. There's a lot of that in hentai. So often you will get artists who are working on these little bits and pieces of a hentai, but they're, like, they're, they're not, you know, they're not drawing any nudity. It's just the, the regular stuff of the hentai. Um, so I, I do think it's one of the reasons why it's, it's more of an open secret in the anime industry than it is over here. Um, and then, of course, you also get the, that, that weirdness, or th that weirdness to us, that they're much more willing in, in Japan to acknowledge that sexuality exists and to be willing to add sexu sexuality to works that we would not. So, you know, you can have a character in a show aimed at tweens, you know, um, um, you know jokingly lift the hem of her shirt and show an underboob or something, um, where we would just be horrified at, at, at the idea of that, and they're not suggesting that the character is, you know, honestly trying to climb into bed with a character with with a, a male character um they're just kind of having fun with this concept um it's yeah but I, I think that's that's one of the reasons why that is and why that that's that's going out there um so yeah i think that's that's that, but i think that's so so remarkable we have so much anime where again, there, there was so much hentai where there's there's plot, and also I mean it it also ties into the fact that so much pretty much all anime is done as um, what do you call it um, it as contract work, where generally speaking animators you know they, they don't work for a studio, uh, they are given work by different studios, and they may they may focus on one studio for a while they may essentially get you know called on to work on one show on a studio but they're not they're not employees of the studio and that makes it a lot easier for them to you know grab little projects here and there there's this going on here I'm I'll do you know a frame of this or a cut of that over here um, and that might include you know again a, a shot or two of hentai especially when it's just a, a random shot of a character on a street corner so that's kind of that's 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 complicated um, but yeah, then you get stuff like Futari Echi, where one of the more, it's certainly the most popular hentai I know of, and you know, tens of millions of copies in print, and it's just a thing, I mean, lots of adults, lots of normal adults read Futari Echi. That That is a, there's no, I mean, you wouldn't tell your mom, but it's read by normal people who don't normally read manga. That is just a thing. And you have, you know, you know, all that stuff going on. Um, and you get weird stuff like Lingerie Fighter Papillon Rose, which is this sort of parody of Magical Girl involving um, um, adult women who fight as Magical Girls in lingerie um, and use uh, various physical implements as wands, let's just put it that way. And, uh, and it's, it's hilarious, um, but it's also kind of, you know, it, it's also very much, you know, not for kids. So you can do that. Um, yeah.
and yeah, and that it's, it's a great point, Liquidus, is that there's as the other the other really nice thing is that there there are enough works out there that are ridiculous and that are having fun with it, and you know are are doing fun things with the concept, and are you know are doing it tongue in cheek, like they recognize they realize what this is. Um. Anyway, so I think. What's also interesting is that this is a thing that has legs. I mean, we all know that if you can make something sexual, it, it's going to find an audience. Is the reality? Um, so you've got to do what you can. Um, in it's interesting though that it has found such a market. It's found so much, you know. It's found so much audience and it's found it's found plots it's found stuff to do which i think is remarkable right so what do you guys want to talk about in, in regards to to hentai uh yes in fact hentai is censored in japan primarily um until very relatively recently um hentai could not uh um um, it was illegal to show genitals in any way, shape, or form in Japanese media. Um, you did because that was just you could not do that. So that was taken care of, right? Um, and one of the problems back in the day is that they would. Um, they they knew that that kind of thing existed, um, so they wouldn't draw that aspect of the character in any sort of detail. So even if you uncensored it, you just see kind of a you know a vague mess. Um, one second. There. Um, so, as a result, like, you, you really couldn't uncensor it. Like, it, was, it didn't make sense to uncensor it. But these days now, they're, they're, they're drawing it to such that you can uncensor it, and it kind of makes sense. Um, but it's not always that way. There's a lot of stuff that just isn't, isn't done that way. Um, where you just, you, again, you can uncensor it, and it's just sort of a, a smear, if you will. So our topic today, um, SVX Tetsuo. Tetsuo is um, hentai. And we're trying to intelligently, you know, understandably, uh, talk about the fact that there's a lot of, of sexual anime out there and why that is. Why is, is, is it so weird? Um, well, I think Desert Fox, you know, one of the reasons it's, re it's referred to is because, again, I, I think culturally, it's understood that like this thing exists, it's out there, why pretend it doesn't? Um, why not have a joke about it? Why not have fun with it? Um, especially when it's it's clearly lighthearted, when it's clearly a comedy. You know, I think um, you can get away with that in anime in a way you can't with a lot of things. And again, remember, anime is a small medium in in Japan, so I think you can get away with that in a way that you couldn't in a you know this is not being shown at five p.m. on a weeknight. And that kind of stuff probably would not fly, but and you know, a certain scientific railgun probably aired at like three a.m., so you know it can get away with stuff that you just can't over here, or you you couldn't even in Japan regularly. But actually, that log and censoring has changed in Japan, um, so it is it is um, th there are ways of getting around it, and there are there were always. Um, um, there were certain exceptions to that rule. Um, so, for example, you know, showing photos of little kids taking baths in historical photographs. You didn't have to censor that. Um, but in general, right? Um, um, yeah, and, and the thing about um, uh, like, like visual novels, for example, is that it's a lot easier to go back and um, clean up or improve, if you will, uh, visual novel art, because it's, it's a single drawing. Um, compared to going back and fixing, you know, original animation 
which um, you know they didn't think would be uncensored. But these days, there's enough you know, there's enough audience for uncensored hentai um, globally that they will go ahead and and do that. Um, um, and also, again, you know, um, I think visual novels are easier to um, they're easier to distribute, right? They're, they're easier to, to, to translate and get out there. So I think there's a there's a lot of call for licensing visual novels outside of Japan, um, especially in, like Asia. I'm like I'm not talking you know Sweden necessarily, but um, you know there's there's a there's a there's a market for that. So I think they're they're much more cognizant of making sure that those things you know look right, if you will, uh, if they're gonna be uncensored and, and released uh, outside. Um, you know, that's the other weird thing is, you know, so much hentai, there's so many, uh, hentai visual novels, there's so many visual novels that contain hentai material that I think that tends to, um, create an expectation that there's going to be that material. So when they do an OVA or even a clean visual novel, there's often an expectation that there's going to be, you know, sexuality, which is, which is weird. But I think that's just that's just the reality of it. That if you're gonna, you know, people people want that stuff for for for, for better or worse. Oh, visual novels are fascinating. I think it's amazing that you'll have a really wonderful relational story. I remember uh, uh, playing one. What was it? Snow story, something like that. And it was just this very lovely story of a guy moves to Hokkaido and just. It has various friends he's he's dealing with, and um, I played through a couple of different the different scenarios, and I was like, I would absolutely play this without the sex scenes. Like the, the sex scenes, okay, they're there um, and they're well drawn, um, but like this is a, a a nice story, and I wish, um, I wish I could let people play this or experience this without saying, oh, and by the way, <laughs> you're halfway through, uh, all of a sudden something's gonna happen. Um, so it's I can I think it's remarkable that there's that, that is such an um, a strong part of visual novels that has just become expected, um, and there are certainly non non uh, there's certainly visual novels that do not contain that material uh, from the get go, and there are a lot of visual novels that get releases that don't have that material, but it's kind of expected you're going to have it somewhere in some release, which is which is weird. Um, how is I viewed by people in Japan? Is it viewed the same way porn is here? I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, I only spent 10 days in Japan. Um, that said, I can actually show you where to go. One second. Ha ha. So, uh, this is relevant to our interests. Um, when I was walking along the street in Japan, um, in Ueno, which is, it has a fair amount of of uh, it's not a red light district but it has you know certain places you can go to get a massage let's just say um but you know there's mcdonald's and you know other normal stuff around um these are more back alley stuff but um i showed up and I actually unfortunately i lost the cover um but i got this somebody handed me this magazine just right on the street um and it you know had characters on it um and i was like oh okay but started flipping through it um and i was like oh that's you know nice girl um you know Nice girl. And don't worry, there's not going to be anything, you know, shocking here. Um, but I just flipped through and, you know, even, there's some ads in here for things. Um, you know, about, uh, you know, there's a little, uh, like, beauty tip thing in here, actually, about, uh, you know, makeup and things. Um, and then I started flipping through and realized, uh, oh, um, I think I know this is advertising. Um, there's an image here of, and here, again, here's a great example. So, and again, there, you know, there's nothing, nothing problematic here. Um, you know, a guy calling, gets a, gets a massage, pays for it. Um, but it's, you know, oh, that's what this is for. <laughs> you know, that's what's going on here. Um, and that's just, that's all it is. And there are 238 pages. Um, just... On and on and on. Now, granted, I'm sure a lot of this is, you know, is not just that. Uh, I'm sure some of this is is you know, legitimate stuff. 
Um, uh, you know, there are a few things here which are, you know, beauty salons, things along those lines. Um, but it's just kind of weird. Um, and again, you, know, you come along and you'll see you know, a character who's, I'm pretty sure that's, that's meant to be more or less Yuripe from Angel Beats. Um, the different hairstyle, but that looks pretty, it's, 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 it's Yuripe slash, you know, Haruhi's, um, thing. And I think that's meant to be the, um, um, the Idol Master uniform. Um, that's just kind of the way that is. Um, and then again, like, you get used to that, and then you get used, then you start seeing illustrations where it's like, I would expect to see that as an ad for a TV anime series, right? Like, that's perfectly... Where can you see that? Where, where did that go? Oh, there it is. Um, you know, there's perfectly acceptable art in here, and it's very weird. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is just handed out on the street. That, that's the thing. It's not just, you know, somebody whispered it to me from an alleyway. This was on the corner here. Have this. Um, so that's kind of different. On the other hand, you know, you're not going to see somebody just kind of standing there um, you know, propositioning girls in the street. It's, it's just very different. Um, so, it's kind of scrolling up. <laughs> so, um, about you know, the question of prostitution in Japan. Um, as I understand it, um, I'm actually not sure because it's changed. For a long time, um, uh, in Japan, prostitution was legal. And we're talking up until the, um, I believe the early 20th century. It was legal. Um, back in the, at one point in, I believe the 1600s, um, a... Um, it was decided that prostitution would be legal only in certain places, right? Um, so, you know, red light districts essentially were created. So they would say, okay, you can, you know, you can do this, but only in these certain locations in the city so that we can kind of monitor it and make sure it doesn't, um, doesn't confuse the uh, people uh, coming in from other places. That may have, may have happened later. Um, anyway, um, so I'm not sure about now. I do know that there's a lot, there are a lot of businesses in Japan that are supposedly not, um, red light district kind of places, but where it happens anyway. Uh, there, there's, it happens a lot. The, the, the police are always talking about how they're, they're raiding places right and left because it just, it happens a lot underneath the radar. Um, so that is just kind of the, you know, the reality of it. Um, yes, some things are subtitled in Japan. Um, while I was there, um, I turned on the TV in the morning to get ready to, to go out, and I saw an episode of Bewitched, subtitled into Japanese. Actually, no, I believe it may have been dubbed. No, I think it was subbed. I think it was subbed in Japanese. Anyway, yeah, it, it, it certainly happens. Um, generally speaking, English language movies are dubbed in Japanese in Japan. Um... So yeah, that, that certainly that certainly happens. Um, I think there's more dubbing than subbing uh, for exactly this kind of the, for the standard reason that the, the average the average viewer doesn't want to read subtitles, so it just it doesn't happen. Um, but yeah, some things some, yeah, they do that. Um, is Japan more lack of sexuality? No, um, Japan is different about sexuality. It is very very different. Um, and again, I'm not Japanese. I'm not an expert. I I I am not here to say this is what the Japanese do and what the Japanese are like. Um, um, but I, I can, you know, safely say that it is just a, a very different culture. Um, um, from what I've seen from pop culture, it's something that you do not talk about, you do not reference, you do not talk to other people about, you know, your, your sexual life, your love life. Um, it's a, an intensely private thing. Um, but as a result of being private, um, it's private. People don't ask about it. People don't push you about it. You know, there's not the whole frat boy, oh, you know, um, you know, tell me all about last night kind of stuff. That just doesn't happen. Again, folks, don't feed the trolls. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's a very different culture. Um, there's also this thing in Japan around this idea. Um, there's, a, there's a saying, and I'm going to butcher it. If you don't have some strange peccadillo, then you're not a, a fully rounded person, right? The most conservative CEO of a country should have a hobby of model trains or, you know, should, uh, you know, believe in Friday the, thir the uh, Friday the 13th superstitions or something. Uh, you know, there should be some weirdness to every person. Otherwise, eh, what's going on? So I think that's one of those things that's just, that's, that's, that's very different and that, that allows people to, to indulge in, in weirdness in a way that uh, we don't over here. And this is a classic example of, I cannot tell you which way is better, right? We in Japan, we in America tend to be in some ways um, more open about sexuality, more open about, you know, how things go. Um, um, you know, we, we, we talk about it amongst ourselves more. Um, in Japan, that does not happen, right? People do not talk about the, what happens in the bedroom. Um, but it is seen as something that is, it is a personal private thing and you, you don't, you know, you don't talk about it. Um, is one healthier than the other? I don't know. Uh, and I don't think that is ultimately an answerable question. I don't think one way is better than the other. Um, as so many things, it's cultural, right? Uh, you, you, you can't just take one part of a culture, take it over here, and then say, do this now. Um, everything's interwoven. So that's something that... Um, who was it? Um, I think it was the creator of Ertsuka Doji was interviewed for um, Legend of the Overfiend, interviewed by a British, um, could have been British or French, um, reporter, and was asked about the difference between, you know, sexuality and, and, and pornography and laws and so forth, and got increasingly frustrated by the fact that he was very matter-of-fact, but that this is just how we do things. And finally, she just burst out, why don't you just do things the way that you, you do things over here in Britain? It was Britain. And he calmly replied, and I said this before, he calmly replied, well, Japan has a much lower rate of violence and, you know, all these things than Britain does, per, even per capita. Maybe you should do things the way we do. Um, uh, now, this also gets into all sorts of aspects of, of culture, where, for example, um, um, uh, sexual violence is vastly underreported in Japan, by all accounts. Um, that's a problem. How much? We don't know. We can't know because it's not reported, by definition. Um, so that's not correct. So the, 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 the thing about uh, that Desert Fox, it's very, very, no. That's, that's, that, 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 well, so here's the thing. The, the official age of consent in Japan is, I believe, actually 12. Um, however, that is the, that is what was written into the original constitution from like the 1860s. Every prefecture in Japan has its own age of consent, and I think the lowest is 16. So there is no place in Japan where the age of consent is that young. Um, you know, most places it's 16 to 18. Um, it's in the end, no, that, that there is... That is a, a confusing aspect to the law, but it, it has not been that way for decades and decades. That may have been the, yeah, girls in ponds is child porn thing. Um, but, yeah, no, the reason they can get away with kind of characters is because, again, Japanese law has this clear understanding that a, an animated character is not real. That is not child pornography by Japanese standards because that is not a child. So you can get away with it. Now, generally in hentai, they will avoid specifically a, you know, naming the age of any character that, that may appear underage. Um, and um, Japanese content producers have become increasingly sensitive to the fact that internationally, 
um, that kind of stuff is frowned on. So at the very least, they, they maintain plausible deniability about the ages of their characters generally, even within the show, even when they don't, you know, they don't have to. Uh, they generally keep it on the down low uh, because, because of that. And, you know, it remains to be seen whether that's going to become a, a, a true reality in future, whether they're going to be, um, you know, whether that stuff is going to eventually go away because you're going to realize, eh, I don't know if there's something we want to kind of uh, to people are internationally are increasingly seeing Japan as a haven for child pornography, basically, and that's just not really great. So there's this open question: is whether folks will just kind of stop making it because it's just like I, you know, this isn't helping anyone. This isn't really improving Japan as a whole. Um, so that stuff might get you know at the very least pushed way underground where. Uh, folks just kind of won't make a big deal out of it. The other complexity b behind this whole thing is that traditionally in Japan, uh, girls were given you know the talk much younger than uh, are traditionally given over here. So a girl the age of you know nine or ten, well before puberty, is generally sat down with her mother and is, you know it's exp and it's explained not just you know the facts of life for a girl, but also the fact that like you know boys are going to start paying attention to you. And, you know, if you wear an outfit that, um, you know, is very revealing, that's going to change how the boys behave around you. Um, and it doesn't mean you can't ever wear something like that. Just, you know, be aware that that's going to be different with your, you know, your friend's going to behave much more weirdly, you know, when you hit 13, 14, when you do that. So just, you know, be aware that, that things are different. Um, and that, you know, he's going to be going through changes too and um you know be respectful of that and be aware that like he has his own you know weirdness and his his own confusing confusing things like be, be aware of that um uh, interesting about star ocean that yeah that uh folks in the west were, were were concerned and so that's interesting i didn't know that um, yeah, it's, it's this classic problem that, you know, welcome to an increasingly international world. Um, you know, a lot of folks say, oh, we should all be open and free and we should, you know, accept everybody and, and be, be happy with this big world, um, and be happy with everyone. But that means that you have to conform to their expectations too, right? If something is culturally unacceptable to them, they're going to react to you as a result of that. Um, you know, that, that is a homogenizing force for better or worse. So, you know, globalization, um, is, is not always the, the most pleasant and, and good thing. It can sometimes mean that somebody else's more restrictive standards become your standards because that's how you avoid, um, you know, some very big unpleasantness. You know, and we've also had to change this over time in generally socially, right? Um, a lot of folks don't realize that up until the 50s, it was not uncommon for um, swimming classes in high schools to be done in the nude. Um, so, you know, you went off to your, your high school and yeah, you stripped down because frankly, no one wanted your, your nasty swimsuit in the public pool. Um, that was just not uncommon um, until you know mid twentieth century, uh, and that's just changed. We know we're we're not gonna we're not gonna do that. Um, so yes, according to the U.S. Code, um, any representation of a character under the age of eighteen engaging in sexual acts, um, possession of that is illegal. I've actually um, cleared that with a uh, a police officer. Um, and, and I've also read the law. So, yes, that is illegal to possess in America, straight up, flat up. Um, you know, I don't know how you get around that. I don't know how you, you stop that or make that any, any different. Um, you, you'd have to change a lot of people in the U.S., hundreds of millions of, of viewpoints in the U.S. to make that different. So I don't see that, see that changing unless there is a broader 
change and difference in understanding about that that aspect of different cultures. Um, you know, I think in Japan, I, the other thing is that like in Japanese culture in general is more comfortable with recognizing the fact that teenagers are sexual beings, um, very flawed sexual beings, very confused sexual beings, um, but they, they, they do have hormones and they do absolutely want to, you know, um, jump into bed with each other. So they're much more comfortable with showing that, with, with recognizing that that happens, especially in a genre where, again, nothing's actually, you know, um, no actual person is, is, is having harm. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the thing. Yeah, and part of the problem, too, comes to just... And, and again, this gets back to what is pornography. Um, socially, we have recognized the fact that pornography is, as you know, in the classic definition, I know it when I see it. There's There, it, there can be a quasi-fine line, um, but it's um, it, there's, it is very rare to see something where you're like... I'm not sure, you know, you know, you pretty well always know. And then when you make something for the public, for public distribution, but it has material that is at that fine line, sometimes you have to go firmly on the side of something, of it being clean. Right? You have to go as squeaky clean as possible so there's no question instead of just, well, we'll tweak this one thing. That often doesn't um, satisfy the, and I, I hate the term censor for this, because classically and traditionally, censorship means um, complete lack of access to something due to government control, right? Something is censored when the government says, you cannot own this, you cannot see this, as far as you're concerned, this thing does not exist. And most of the time, we're talk when we're talking about censorship in modern in the modern world, we're not talking about that. We're talking about you know something becoming um, less available or unavailable in a certain medium or in a certain you know marketplace. It's still available in other places, but just not available here. And I just, to me, that's not censorship per se. But yeah, I think uh, you know that's a good example where some things get localized, and it's like you know you need to be very clear that this is on this side of the line. Um, and I think, you know, like you say, hem, anime is hard to explain. A lot of things are hard to explain. A lot of things are hard to just throw in front of, in front of somebody and say, "Well, this is okay, isn't it?" Like, yes, you're seeing a flash of a 14 year old girl's panties. So what? To the average, you know, Midwestern American housewife, no, <laughs> that's not like so what. Um, and also, let's let's be honest. Um, if we lived in a world where young teenage girls, where images of highly sexualized young teen girls were ubiquitous, that would be a very different world. I think we can all agree that that, that would have impacts. Um, so it, it's why I have a problem with the whole censorship thing. It's like, I actually, I'm, I'm fine with the fact that hentai isn't like plastered all over every billboard everywhere. I don't want to live in that world. Um, we, we've, we've had cases where folks just kind of go nuts on all this material, and it usually turns out poorly for them. Um... Yeah, hentai is is I think something I'm 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 glad is not mainstream, uh, obviously. But yeah. So anyway, so that I, I think we've we've done a good job of covering some of the territory there. Um, as others have said, this is not all that is to be said about this, but I think that's a, a good place to pause the conversation at the very least. Uh, thanks to the chat room for their uh, their discussions. Um, so, yeah.